Have you just enjoyed episode 4 of the Book of Boba Fett? Well, now enjoy episode 4 of this Book of Boba Fett, The Mandalorian Armor. But before we read uh, chapter 10, I'm going to do a couple of little shout-outs to people in the comments. Rich Gardner, who's uh, commented on the first episode of this series, saying kind of wishing they'd have taken more ideas from this book and put them into the show so far. Glad we get to have both versions, though. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd be really interested to know what parts of this book would you have liked to see in the episodes of the show so far? What bits do you think are missing? Do you think they might come in? And that goes out to anyone. Please answer that question below in the comments. Matt Curtis, you mentioned there's a Dark Horse comic book series as the Bounty Hunter Wars. Is that it? Is that the, the War of the Bounty Hunters or is it a different one that I don't know? Um, this book I do know is part of the trilogy that's called the Bounty Hunter Wars. Um, that's a trilogy of novels including uh, this book... It's the Mandalorian armor, slave ship, and hard merchandise are the three books in the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy. And lastly, uh, a little shout out to Tony Vlashin, who commented on the last video. Thanks very much for coming. It's really great to have you here. So, let us carry on now with Chapter 10, which is taking place just after the events of Star Wars A New Hope, before The Empire Strikes Back. You've been a long time away said the Emperor. The ancient withered head slowly nodded. Many are the stars you travel among. All my journey is in your service. Prince Zizor inclined his head, a courtly signal of submission. The dark serpent of his topknot brushed against his shoulder. And to the glory of the Empire. Well spoken as always. Emperor Palpatine swiveled his throne toward another section of the immense room. Whatever else might be said of him, you must agree that the prince has a way with words. Don't you think so, Vader? Zizor turned toward the hologram of the dark, caped figure, an intimidatingly life-sized image transmitted from the Devastator, Lord Vader's personal flagship. Don't try it on this one, Zizor warned himself. He had witnessed too many examples of what happened to those whose words caused the Dark Lord of the Sith to lose patience. The Emperor might be keeping him on a short leash, but one long enough, thought Zizor, to reach my throat. Your judgment, my lord, exceeds mine. Vader kept his own words as diplomatically inscrutable as the mask that concealed his face. You know best where to place your trust. Sometimes, Vader, I think you'd prefer it if I trusted no one but you. The Emperor put his fingertips together. Behind him, framed in the towering windows of the throne room, the curved arms of the galaxy extended, like schools of gems in an ink-black sea. Below the stars, the towers and massive shapes of Imperial City rolled like the crests of a frozen sea across the hidden surface of Coruscant, a monument in Jurisdeal to both the ambition and the grasp of Palpatine. I see into so many creatures' hearts, and all I find there is fear, which is as it should be. The deep-set eyes contemplated the empty cage formed by his hands, as though envisioning the words bound by the Empire's power. But when I look into yours, Vader, I see something else. Like a hooded mendicant rather than the ruler of worlds, Emperor Palpatine peered through the angles of his fingers. Something almost like desire. Prince Zizor managed to keep his own smile from showing. Desire, among the Farleen, his species, meant only one thing. His cruel beauty, the sharply chiseled planes of his face, and his regal bearing combined with a pheromone-rich musk that evaded all conscious senses, were what put a female of any world under his command. A humanoid female, of a type pleasing to his own sense of aesthetics. If the members of the more repulsive of the galaxy species were similarly affected, that was not something he had yet felt the need to put to the test. It is only the desire to serve you, said Lord Vader, and the Empire. Of course, what else could it be? 
Palpatine smiled indulgently, an effect no less intimidating than any other expression that moved across his age-creased face. But I am surrounded by those who wish to serve me. Zizor, for one. The Emperor's hand gestured toward him. He says all the same things as you do. If you are closer to what's left of my heart, Vader. If for the moment I place more trust in you than I do in the others. It's because of something beyond words. Actions, said Zizor with cold hauteur, indicate more than words. Judge my loyalty by what I achieve for the Empire. And what is that? Vader's image turned the force of its penetrating gaze upon Zizor. You scurry about on your mysterious self-appointed errands, your rounds of those whose devotion to our cause is somewhat less than ideal. Fear motivates many creatures, but there are still those who can believe their meager cunning can line their pockets. Criminals, conspirators, thieves, and builders of their own little empires. You know too many of those types, Zizor. I sometimes wonder what their attraction is for you. Standing against Vader, even in this insubstantial form, was like facing radiation hard enough to strip flesh from bone. Not for the first time, Zizor felt an invisible hand settle around his throat. His own willpower kept the breath sliding in and out of his lungs. But if Vader were to unleash his complete wrath, the force of will might not be enough. Zizor had seen others, the highest ranking officers in the Empire's forces, clutching their throats and gasping for air, writhing like a Dattooian garfish, caught on a barbed trawling line. Perhaps wisely, Vader tended to avoid such displays in front of the Emperor. Why tempt the old man into showing how much greater was his own mastery of the Force that penetrated and bound the galaxy together? There is no attraction for me, Lord Vader. As always before, he wondered just how much Vader knew, how much he might suspect, and how much he could prove. Vader's disdain for the galaxy's less reputable schemers and thugs was well known. He dealt with such as bounty hunters only on rare occasions. Which is to my benefit, thought Zizor. For Vader and the Imperial High Command, criminals and mercenaries were all vermin that would be swept away, and soon if their latest plans went as expected. So that kind is left to me. He had built his own shadow empire, that of the Black Sun, out of exactly such rejected dregs. If the Emperor and Vader didn't want to dirty their hands, then he had no such tender scruples. I do what I must, said Zizor, not untruthfully. The fact that he was still standing here in Emperor Palpatine's private sanctuary and not cut down by the Emperor's or Vader's swift wrath indicated that Black Sun still operated in the eclipse of its secrecy. For now, thought Zizor. He turned toward the Emperor. This sacrifice, he lied, I also make on your behalf. Judge as well those who think it beneath them. Excellent. The Emperor displayed a cold smile. If you had no other value to me, Zizor, I would still require your presence just for the stimulating effect you have on Lord Vader. He already hates my entrails thought Zizor as he glanced over at the black-robed figure. Nothing had been lost in this exchange. But you still haven't answered my questions. The Emperor leaned forward, his sharp gaze fastening on Zizor. I summoned you here for a reason. Let us set aside for the time being all this fractious comparison between your loyalty and that of Lord Vader. You say you have been busy on my behalf. On yours, my lord, and the Empire's. One and the same thing, Zizor, as all the world soon shall know. The Emperor settled back in the throne. 
Very well. Your doings are not something which you have discussed with either Lord Vader or myself. Either you have shown commendable initiative or foolhardy rashness. Any trace of amusement had drained out of the Emperor's voice. Now is your chance to convince me that the former is the case. He had known that this time would come. It was one thing to go out and set one's schemes in motion. That was the easy part. But it was another to come back here and defend those schemes when one's life or death depended upon eloquence. And, thought Zizor, lying eloquence at that. As great as your empire is, my lord, it is still at peril. The combined gaze of Vader and the Emperor made him feel as transparent as glass, as though their mastery over the Force enabled them to look straight into the essence he kept so carefully shielded. Great are your powers, but they are still not enough to achieve all that you want. You say nothing new. Contempt showed in the Emperor's eyes. That is the same thing that my admirals tell me. They are not believers, as Lord Vader is. They doubt the existence of any power that they cannot unleash with the push of a button. They doubt, even when they've had the edifying experience of feeling the force crushing the life out of them. Doubt weakens and makes fools out of such creatures. An unwavering hand raised and pointed towards Zizor. You're not such a fool, are you? Zizor bowed his head. I do not doubt, my lord. That's why I'm still listening to you. The emperor's hand lowered and stroked the arm of the throne. My patience is such, however, that I listen to the imperial admirals as well. Fools that they are. Even fools say wise things from time to time, and that is why I gave permission for their great project, the construction of what they call the Death Star. You should have listened to me, said Vader. The rush of his breath sounded louder and angrier. The rebellion was growing even then, and the admirals wasted your time on such folly. I told them that the Death Star, when it was completed, would be a machine and nothing more. Its power would be nothing compared to that which you already possess. Vader's voice darkened in tone, indicating the depths of his annihilating temper. And I was proved right, was I not, my lord? Indeed you were, Vader. The Emperor gave a single nod. But even in the wretchedness of their folly, my admirals were still right about one thing. Their little minds are made of the same unenlightened stuff as are the minds of most of the galaxy's inhabitants. They see things the same way, and other things are invisible to them. The Jedi Knights are no longer. They were the only ones other than ourselves who could see the Force for what it is. These lesser creatures are blind to that which moves the stars in all the world's skies and the blood in the veins of those below. They need something they can see. That was what my admirals hoped to give them with the Death Star. Its power, such as it was, lay within the comprehension of all the lesser creatures. It would have evoked the fear and obedience that the subtleties of the Force would take a great deal longer to achieve. You were right that it was a machine and nothing more, but still a useful machine. A tool. When all that is required is a hammer, it is a folly to turn the universe's primal energy to such mundane purposes. Darth Vader stood, unmoved by the Emperor's words. I trust that you'll remember one thing. A hammer can be broken, as can any other tool. The Death Star was destroyed, but the Force is eternal. I won't forget, Vader. But for now, all such simple tools are the concern of my admirals. 
Let them occupy themselves with building better ones, if they can. We have already distracted ourselves from our purpose here. The Emperor turned back toward Prince Zizor. You say the Empire is at risk? You tell me nothing new. I am aware of the threat presented by the Rebel Alliance. A threat that will be extinguished in due time. But the level of your concerns, Izor, is what I find surprising. It sounds like doubt to me, no matter what you say to the contrary. And doubt should be eliminated at the source. Not doubt, but the truth. The edges of Zizor's own intricately stitched robes trailed across his boots as he folded his arms across his chest. You cannot vanquish the Alliance without creating new threats to your authority. As your power increases and becomes closer to absolute, so does an unavoidable hazard. A hazard that is woven into the very fibre of the Empire. He speaks nonsense, my lord. Nonsense to those who cannot see... Zizor gazed from the corner of his eye at the black-garbed figure standing next to him. Perhaps Lord Vader is blinded by the Force. After all, his mastery of it is not equal to your own. The invisible hand Zizor felt at his throat suddenly tightened, as hard and constricting as an iron band. Even Vader's mere image had the power to kill. Zizor's chin was thrust backward, the vision in his eyes filled with trapped blood. Leave him be, Vader. The Emperor's voice came from the somewhere beyond that darkening red cloud. I'm intrigued by what he has to say. I want to hear the rest before I make my decision. The hand let go, and breath flooded back into Zizor's lungs, he had kept his arms folded throughout the brief ordeal, determined not to claw at his throat the way he'd seen Vader's other weaker victims do. But I won't forget, brooded Zizor. The other's touch, invisible or not, was an affront to the haughty pride that was characteristic of all Faulines. The day would come when all such offences would be paid for. I speak better, said Zizor, when the Emperor keeps a tight leash on his underlings. His voice rasped in his throat. When he swallowed, he tasted his own blood. But the quality of those who serve my lord is exactly that on which I need to speak. His slit-pupiled gaze took in Vader and the Emperor. You have both spoken of the fools who serve the Empire. Necessary fools, but fools nonetheless. Do you think the situation is going to get any better, especially now that the rebellion courts all those with an independent streak to their natures? A sneer sounded in Vader's voice. They seal their fates with their independent natures, as you describe them. The rebels will be crushed. Undoubtedly so, said Zizor. But that day of triumph is delayed by the Emperor's own power. That seems a riddle, but it is one that can be solved by those with eyes to see. Go on. The Emperor gestured towards Zizor. You have my full attention. Make sure you use it well. He had prepared for this moment. The words were already chosen. He had only to speak them, and then await the outcome of his gamble. As I said, the problem is with those who serve you. Zizor pointed to the high, transparent steel windows behind the throne, with their vista of limitless stars. And all the worlds that are within your grasp, those who resist your power will be crushed. Lord Vader speaks the truth about that. But what does that leave you? Fools such as the Imperial Admirals. Fools who cannot even recognize the existence of the Force. If they are not fools before they enter your service, they become so soon after. How can it be otherwise? Your power annihilates their will. Their capacity to judge and make decisions. Their ability to operate on their own. Not everyone in the galaxy has a nature as strong as mine or Lord Vader's. 
This is true, said Emperor Palpatine, and it is not a matter that has gone unnoticed by me. I see those who have gone over to the side of the rebellion, and I recognize their strengths. It is a cruel waste to destroy them, no matter how necessary that might be. His voice dropped low and musing. How much better it would be if they could be brought over to our side. Zizor concealed a shiver of disgust. As far-reaching as his own ambitions were, they paled by comparison to Palpatine's. There was something in the withered figure that didn't want to control the galaxy's sentient creatures, but to consume them the way a greedy hut swallowed its wriggling food. The small and weak ones will go first, thought Zizor. And then someday, it'll be the turn of Vader and me. That would be the reward for their loyalty. To be consumed at last. Survival as well as ambition had dictated the creation of Black Sun. The rebels were brave idiots to openly oppose the Emperor's might. For himself, Zizor had already decided that an existence in the shadows, the darkness in which criminals always wrapped themselves, was preferable to the Empire's insatiable appetite. There are those, said Zizor, who would prefer death rather than serve the Empire. Palpatine gave a small shrug. So be it. But in the meantime, you must deal with those whom you do command. And many of those are, let us be realistic about this, my lord, not of the first calibre. Some were born fools, others achieved idiocy through their own efforts. But many of the rest simply had their minds and spirits obliterated by your power. Zizor unfolded his arms so he could spread his hands apart, palms outward. Fear is an effective motivator, but it is also a corrosive one. It has an effect inside those who suffer it. Are you one of those, Zizor? He shook his head. Since I do not fear death, I do not fear that which might cause it. I fear your disapproval, my lord. Another lie. If your displeasure is sufficient cause for my death, then I will have earned that fate. You haven't displeased me, said the Emperor. Yet, continue. Not many of your servants, my lord, would risk your anger by telling you what you need to know. If some call me rash, he glanced over at Vader, you nevertheless might come to value my excess of courage. For this is the truth. That which makes you powerful that makes sentient creatures into tools in your hands is the same thing that makes those tools weak and ineffective. It is an unavoidable concomitant of great power. There are those that I command, though not at a scale comparable to you, and I can see it in their eyes. And if you wish to crush the rebellion, you will need the strongest possible forces at your call. I have contacts. Spies that I have planted within the Alliance, and they have informed me of both the Rebels' plans and their determination to achieve them. They'll stop at nothing to achieve your overthrow. That's how insane their hunger for freedom is. He understood how the Rebels felt. If he hadn't cast his lot in with the Black Sun, he could easily have joined the Alliance. You will win, of course, my lord. Power such as yours always wins but not without cunning, and not without the services of your underlings. And that's where the problem lies. The more overwhelming the control that you establish over your empire, and as more and more of the universe's sentient creatures come under your dominion, the more you risk losing the very elements you need to complete your galaxy-wide homogeny and defend it from the small but growing forces of the rebellion. Lord Vader spoke up. At one time I would have said that such words were nonsense, if not close to treason. However, I am forced to admit that Prince Zizor may speak the truth. 
I would have not had the difficulties that I've experienced with the Imperial High Command if their brains were not addled with cowardice. But then, if your admirals were wiser creatures, the Death Star would not have been destroyed so easily. Precisely so. Things were going better than Zizor had hoped. To have Vader agree with him about anything was a surprise. The Empire, by its very nature, destroys that which it needs to grow and survive. Take the Imperial Stormtroopers, for example. You have trained them to obey, to fight, and to die in the service of the Empire. But not to think. The same holds true with practically everyone else throughout the Empire's chain of command, right up to the topmost ranks. Most of your underlings, my lord, lack any creative spark, any capability of deep analysis or real cunning. That's all been beaten out of them, crushed by your power. But the fledgling elements of the rebellion do possess those characteristics. That's why they're in the rebellion. Foolish they may be, to the point of being suicidal, nevertheless... Their rebellious nature is exactly that which makes them a threat to the Empire. The Emperor nodded, mulling over Zizor's words. You're very eloquent on this matter. I don't have to worry about you showing initiative, do I? Palpatine raised his head, showing his unpleasant smile. So what would you have me do about my servants? Perhaps I should just be kinder to them. Would that work? Sarcasm turned his voice darker and uglier. Or else I should just throw away the power I hold over them. But then, what power would I have left? It is not a matter of throwing away power, my lord. Even as they are, your servants have their uses. A hammer doesn't need a mind or a spirit to fulfill the purpose of he who holds it. Your admirals obey your orders. That is sufficient for them. The Imperial Stormtroopers are tools for creating the desired level of terror on your subject planets. They would be less terrifying if they were capable of thought. But they are like machines right to the core that no longer exist in them. Set upon their course, they obey and die and kill, with no possibility of swaying them from their orders, by appeal to reason or emotion. That is how it should be. That is how those servants are most useful to you and to the Emperor's glory. With a nod of his head, Zizor indicated the stars, slowly wheeling behind the throne. Nothing is achieved by throwing away those tools, my lord, however limited their uses may be. But what you might find are other tools, ones that are not within the absolute grasp of your power. I think, said the Emperor, that I already have such tools and such servants standing here in front of me. Just so. Lord Vader's image regarded Zizor for a moment, then turned again toward the Emperor. And you must decide whether such a tool's usefulness is greater or less than the danger it represents to the Empire. Back to where we were before, thought Zizor. If Vader had appeared to agree with him, it had been only for a moment and only for the purpose of driving another wedge between the Emperor and any of Vader's rivals for influence. Some day he and I will come to grips with each other. With a grim determination, Zizor looked forward to the confrontation with Darth Vader. And then we'll settle things once and for all. The Emperor spoke up. When that happens, Palpatine said coolly. It will be a judgment laid upon you as well, Lord Vader. Let your judgment be on our accomplishments, my lord. Zizor's gesture took in both himself and Vader. And on our service to you. But as I said, the Empire requires other servants and tools. 
and those cannot be such as your stormtroopers and admirals, or even such as Lord Vader and myself. To destroy the rebellion, to crush once and for all the resistance that has grown against your power, you must employ those who have sworn no loyalty to you. I think, Prince Zizor, that you may be increasing the dangers to the Empire rather than lessening them. Then I have yet to make my meaning clear to you, my lord. Extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. The day will come when the rebellion is no more, when your grasp of all the galaxy's worlds will be final and never-ending. Then you will have no need of servants and tools with minds of their own. You may perhaps have no need of me, but that is no concern of mine. My fate is nothing compared to the glory of the Empire. But that time is not yet here. In this time you must take into your hand the most dangerous tools. If a viper blade's edge is sharp enough to cut both ways, then he who uses it must be careful. But the only thing more dangerous than picking it up is the failure to do so. You've thought this over a great deal, Prince Zizor. The Emperor's cold, deep-set eyes studied him. I can hear in your words the sound of well-polished gears meshing together. You seek to convince me. Very well, you have, to some degree. But what I haven't heard from you is what these sharp-edged tools are that I should bend to my purposes. That answer is very simple, said Zizor. The tools you need are those individuals known as the Bounty Hunters. Vader's words broke in, deeper and even more contempt-filled. We have gone here from folly to madness. What the Prince seeks to convince you of is nonsense. We waste our time even contemplating it. While Prince Zizor amuses himself with these idiotic notions, the Rebellion marshals its forces and conspires against the Empire. Your antipathy to the Prince's suggestion seems somewhat extreme, Lord Vader. Beneath the unadorned hood, the Emperor's head tilted to one side. Have you not employed bounty hunters yourself from time to time? You have even spoken to me of one rather enigmatic individual named Boba Fett. He's been a bounty hunter for long enough to have gained a reputation nearly as fear-inspiring as your own. A bounty hunter has his uses, said Vader stiffly. The prince is correct about that, but they are limited. If I've given a few of your credits to any of them, Boba Fett included, it was because they were willing to do those jobs dirty enough to match their own mercenary natures. Bounty hunters come from the sewers of the galaxy. They find it agreeable to troll through various criminal dens, sinkholes of depravity that can be found on any number of planets, and locate those whose greed, rather than misplaced idealism, has brought them into contact with the rebellion. Scum seeks out other scum. Even our Imperial stormtroopers are incapable of anything but the most rudimentary searches through places like that. Exactly said Zizor. Even if those were the only uses that bounty hunters had, they would still be of irreplaceable value to the Empire. But they have more than that. Lord Vader uses the word mercenary. He speaks perhaps more tellingly than he realizes. He could sense, even through the dark lenses of Vader's mask, the angry reaction his words provoked. A bounty hunter is just that, a mercenary. Boba Fett and the others like him will do anything for credits. It is greed and not fear that drives them. And that alone marks them as different from your admirals and stormtroopers, my lord. Violence is a commodity for the bounty hunters, not merely the result of following orders. Creatures such as those that serve in the Empire's military forces are blind to the deaths and terror they create. They do as much as they are told to, and then they stop, like children's toys whose power sources have run down. 
Bounty hunters, on the other hand, seek to maximize the return from their efforts. They have an entrepreneurial attitude, rarely found, if ever, among your followers. Though it is found often enough, said Vader, among the galaxy's criminal classes. The suspicion struck Zizor once again about just how much Vader knew or could prove. The difference between those conditions might be what kept Vader silent. For now, thought Zizor. If you are referring to such creatures as the Huts, you are correct, Zizor pointed to the windows full of stars. And there are others besides them, working away, building up their own little empires and spheres of influence. They'll be dealt with eventually. The only reasons we should not eliminate them right now is that the rebellion is a more pressing concern, and the huts and their ilk provide an environment for the bounty hunters to flourish in. And that is to our advantage. Criminals, such as the infamous Jabba, keep the members of the Bounty Hunters Guild fed on a regular basis so that they're available for our purposes whenever we need them. Independent operators such as Boba Fett find a way to survive and even prosper no matter what. Since Bounty Hunters deliver their services to the highest bidder, the Empire can always get the best ones to take care of our dirty work, as Lord Vader would call it. And right now, there is a great deal of dirty work that must be dealt with. Sewers, grated Vader, and the vermin that live in them are better dealt with by draining rather than lying down in them. The Rebellion doesn't have the sort of scruples that you and I do, Lord Vader. Zizo regarded the black road figure through narrowed eyes. And that is why the Rebellion is a growing danger to us. The rebels' desperation leads them to places that the Imperial Stormtroopers and all our spies and informers are incapable of entering. Or, if they do go in there, they don't come back out except as corpses. The creatures that live in those shadows may be scum, but they are clever scum, for the most part. The Rebellion can deal with them, but the Empire can't. We need intermediaries that are just as clever and ruthless, and the only ones that fit the requirements are the bounty hunters. Your bickering does not interest me. The Emperor's voice was like the lash of a whip, pulling both Vader's and Zizor's attention toward the throne. Palpatine's hard gaze shifted toward Zizor. Even if what you say is true, even if, Zizor, you have convinced me that your words contain any wisdom, there are still problems with the course you recommend. True, I prefer terror and fear to any other means of ensuring obedience to my commands. Fear obliterates sentient creatures' essences, and that is always a worthwhile result. But I have no absolute aversion to buying the services the Empire requires, whether from bounty hunters or anyone else. Perhaps Boba Fett and the others have no spirits to be eradicated. If there is still something within them that can be driven by greed, then I can use that. But you still have not convinced me that these bounty hunters are the efficient tools you say they are. My lord, I speak only of silence. The emperor grasped the throne's arms and leaned forward, gaze boring into the slit pupils of Zizor's eyes. There is little that I do not know of in this galaxy. I know more than you can imagine, Zizor. Remember that. And I know a great deal about Boba Fett and the others, the ones who belong to the Bounty Hunters Guild. Before you ever came to my court, I was aware of Fett. Not everything that you regard as a mystery about him is a secret to me. He wears the armor of the Mandalorian warriors. He's earned the right to that armor by his own prowess. Lord Vader possesses some of the knowledge that belonged to the Mandalorians. I possess more. 
Believe me, you deal with Boba Fett at your own peril. But in that, he is unique among the bounty hunters. You recommend them to me as tools that I can use against the Rebellion. I say that indicates you are a fool, Zizor. The Bounty Hunters Guild is a joke in which I find no amusement. Zizor bowed his head. You anticipate the arguments that I wish to make, my lord. I anticipate nothing more but idiotic prattle from you. The bounty hunters which you display such an obsession are a fading remnant of what they once were. The Bounty Hunters Guild is an organization of senile aging creatures and incompetent young bumblers. If any of them had the least amount of skills, they would wash their hands of the guild and go independent like Boba Fett. Deep disgust sounded in the Emperor's voice. The guild members band together and cling to each other because they know they would have no chance in the galaxy on their own. That's why Boba Fett has nothing to do with them. On that point, my lord, I must respectfully offer a correction. Zizor displayed a thin smile. The renowned Boba Fett, the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy has already applied for membership in the guild. And I anticipate that Kradosk and the others on the Bounty Hunters Guild Council will have no objection to his becoming one of their number. That is impossible. Vader's words were flatly emphatic. I have had enough experience with Boba Fett to know that he would never do such a thing. He values his independence too much, and he has nothing but contempt for the Bounty Hunters Guild. You've gone from unassuming jests, Prince Zizor, to unconvincing lies. I neither jest nor lie, Lord Vader. He turned back toward the Emperor on the throne. Boba Fett has applied for membership in the Bounty Hunters Guild at my instigation. He does not know that it was my idea that he should do so, or that his actions in this serve the purposes of the Empire. I use an intermediary to plant the notion in Boba Fett's head, one whose discretion is sufficient for this task. Zizor had no intention of revealing his involvement with the assembler Kudam Bat. To do so would only heighten Vader's suspicions about his network of shady and outright criminal contacts. As with everything he does, Boba Fett's actions in this matter are motivated by his own greed as were Kadama Bats. He had gone to the Assembler and pitched the scheme to it as the leader of the Black Sun organization, and not as the loyal servant of the Emperor. His greed matches that of Aids Kradosk and all the rest of the Bounty Hunters Guild. They all think they have something to gain by this change in their relationship to each other. But it is really you, Emperor Palpatine, that shall reap all the benefits. This makes no sense, growled Vader. How could Boba Fett be convinced that this would be in his advantage to join the Bounty Hunters Guild? Zizor turned his knowing half-smile in Vader's direction. It is a rather simpler matter than you think. My intermediary convinced Boba Fett to join the Guild, not to be one of the Guild's members, but to be the agent of its destruction. The Emperor nodded in appreciation. I begin to see aspects of your guile, Prince Zizor, of which I had not been aware. In your service, my lord. Think of it. You are as knowledgeable as Lord Vader about Boba Fett's nature. His cunning and ruthlessness are legendary throughout the galaxy. Placed in the context of the Bounty Hunters Guild, those elements are bound to be disruptive. Sharp divisions already exist among the Guild's members, between the old leadership of the Council members like Kradosk and the younger bounty hunters such as his son. The Bounty Hunters Guild is in many ways a microcosm of the Republic that your Empire has replaced, an aging bureaucratic conglomerate with its best days far behind it. 
Where once the guild was nearly as ruthless and efficient as Boba Fett, it now parcels out assignments to its members, divides up territories and responsibilities, pays off the galaxy's various law enforcement agencies, shares out the steadily diminishing proceeds to its members, always with more going to the leadership, less to the lower-ranking bounty hunters, who are still doing the hard and dangerous work upon which the organization depends. So, naturally, those younger members, if they have any intelligence and self-interest at all, spend more time trying to claw their way up to the guild's ranks rather than actually chasing bounties. Zizor let his own contempt sound in his voice. The fate of the Bounty Hunters Guild was something that he was not going to let happen to Black Sun. In fact, he had taken a leaf from Emperor Palpatine's book. Autocracy, even tyranny, was how one kept an organization tough and alive. The Republic deserves to die, Prince Zizor. The Emperor raised one hand from the throne's arm. It sounds as if you have passed a similar judgment upon the Bounty Hunters Guild. I did that which I knew you would want me to do, my lord. Your attention is focused upon the weightiest matters of the galaxy, and its transformation from indolence and democracy to a hard, shining instrument of your will. The fate of the Bounty Hunters Guild, while necessary for us to determine to your satisfaction, is but a small part of that process, and easily achieved. Given a wisdom that is but a reflection of your own. The guild is tottering, riven by the antagonistic forces it contains. If the Council of the Bounty Hunters Guild had but a fraction of your wisdom, my lord, they would never allow Boba Fett to become a member. They would be able to foresee the doom that he brings into their midst. But their greed blinds them. All they will be able to envision is the possibility of his skills bringing more credit into the guild's coffers. The younger members of the guilds will see that as well, and their greed will also be stimulated. Each group will try to bring Boba Fett exclusively onto their side, and thus the delicate balance that has kept the guild in one piece will be destroyed. You've put much thought into this, Prince Zizor. The Emperor's bony finger pointed toward him. If all goes as you believe it will, then there will be rewards for you as well. How can it not proceed as I have envisioned? Zizor raised his head, bringing his eyes straight into the Emperor's intimidating gaze. My intermediary has convinced Boba Fett of the advantages he will gain by the destruction of the Bounty Hunters Guild. That is why he has gone along with this scheme. The Guild is still an annoyance to him, a hindrance to his own enterprises. Bumblers the Guild's members may be, but they still manage to get in Fett's way from time to time. With the Guild broken up and dispersed, Nothing would stand between Boba Fett and complete control of the galaxy's bounty hunter trade. The fees he charges for his services are already astronomical. With no competition to turn to, clients such as Huts would have to pay whatever Fett demands. That may be so, said Vader. But what benefit does the Empire derive from the destruction of the bounty hunter's guild? We can already pay Boba Fett anything he asks for but I see no advantage in being forced to pay him more than he's worth. What the Empire gets, replied Zizor, is a return to the times before the creation of the Bounty Hunters Guild, a time when the galaxy's mercenaries were all as independent, hungry, and ruthless as Boba Fett, a time when they were at each other's throats with no pretense of brotherhood, when the bounty hunters' greed was not limited by the strictures of the bureaucracy they have sealed around themselves. Kra Dosk and the others of his generation have grown fat and lazy, somnolent within the protective walls of the guild. Eventually, the guild and all that remain part of it will wither away and die. But we cannot wait for that time to come. The rebellion is a threat now. The Empire needs many creatures like Boba Fett, Hungry and greedy and independent enough to carry out our dirty work. 
the younger bounty hunters in the guild chafe at its weight pressing upon their shoulders, its chains tangled around their feet. To destroy the bounty hunters' guild would be to free them, right into the service of the Empire. You overvalue these scum. I think not. The Emperor interrupted Vader. Prince Zizor speaks truly when he says that the forces under my command cannot do that which the bounty hunters are capable of, or that they would be capable of if the guild were eliminated. Greed is valuable to me only if it is combined with a capacity for violence. And that capacity is exactly what would be unleashed when the Bounty Hunters Guild is no more. The survivors, whichever ones are left after Boba Fett's presence, has shattered the organization, will be forced to adapt to a harsher, less protected existence. One in which they can survive only by placing their boot soles on the throats of those who had been their brothers only a short time before. The Emperor's cruel smile widened. We will have our choice of them, each savage and driven by their unchecked appetites. The Prince is right. These tools will be sharp and murderous indeed. My lord flatters me. Zizor spread his hands, palms outward. It is only the wisdom I have received from you, that has guided both my thoughts and deeds. You are the flatterer, Zizor. In that, you do not deceive me. But your value to me has been enhanced by what you have done in this regard. The Emperor's smile faded, replaced by a hard gaze. You have taken a considerable gamble in proceeding with your little scheme before consulting with me. If you had not been successful in convincing me of its worth, the consequences to you would have been severe. I know that, my lord, but time and events press upon us. The rebellion's forces are not waiting for us to put our affairs in order. Lord Vader's image shook its head, the points of light from the stars glistening on the black surface of his helmet. Better that our trust should be put in the force. Its power is greater than anything that can be derived from all these petty manipulations. The Death Star, Prince Zizor's unleashed bounty hunters, all these distract us from the Empire's real strength. Vader raised a black fist as though crushing a rebellious world inside it. Do not let yourself be swayed by the vain schemes of those who have no conception of the power inside you. Advise me not, Lord Vader. The Emperor's anger flared, like fire suddenly revealed beneath grey ashes. You have some training in the Force's ways. You have even exceeded the training given to you by your banished Jedi Masters. But do not presume to consider yourself my equal. Zizor kept his silence watching the confrontation between Palpatine and the black-garbed figure standing before him. Let him suffer the Emperor's wrath, thought Zizor with a measure of satisfaction. The Emperor's seductive powers had created Vader, the call of the Force's dark side turning him into what he now was. The Emperor could destroy Vader as well, Zizor was sure of it, and if that happened, then my most powerful enemy would be gone, and the worlds would open before him. The rays of the black sun would reach even farther across the galaxy, perhaps even as far as the shadows of the Emperor's hand. There would be another reward as well. If Vader's destruction came about, an even more satisfying one, the reward of vengeance accomplished. That would be my reward brooded Zizor. Not that of the Black Sun. Vader had no idea, yet, of the hatred that was directed towards whatever was left of his heart. The Imperial records had been wiped clean. Zizor's credits and power had seen to that. Of any trace of the deaths of his family on the planet Farleen, 
deaths brought about by Vader's own experiments in developing new forms of biological weaponry for the Empire. Zizor's parents, his brothers and sisters, along with a quarter million other innocent Farleens, had been reduced to ashes by the sterilization lasers Vader's orders had turned upon the bacterial outbreak. But those ashes were still hot in Zizor's own heart. With his face a mask, except for his narrow gaze, he watched his enemy. I mean no presumption, my lord. Darth Vader bowed his head in submission. Yet, it irks you if I show favor to another of my servants. The Emperor smiled and nodded slowly. Perhaps that is an indication of the depth of your loyalty to me. His withered hand pointed to Vader and Zizor in turn. Your animosity toward each other serves my purposes well. There is never a moment when you are not at each other's throats, seeking what advantage you can in your struggle to please me. So be it. It keeps your teeth sharp. That is why I think Prince Zizor's scheme has a chance, however slight, of succeeding. The bounty hunters will to be to each other what the two of you are, hungry and ruthless. The struggle will end some day, with one of you destroying the other. I'm not sure which one of you will be the victor, and I do not greatly care either. The Emperor appeared to savor the possibilities. In the meantime, the Empire enjoys the benefits of your little war. One that I will win, thought Sizor. And after that, it would be time for other plans and schemes. For all his respectful words, the Force and the Emperor's mastery of it meant nothing to him. Of what use was the greatest power in the universe, if he even existed at all, and wasn't just some figment of Vader and Palpatine's imaginations, when it was in the hands of a fool? and an aging one at that, so obsessed with the rebellion that he would allow a greater danger to him walk the corridors of his palace. He doesn't know, thought Zizor, keeping his own face a mask as he gazed at the Emperor. Despite having given himself over to the dark side of the Force, Emperor Palpatine didn't suspect what was still hidden in the shadows surrounding him. Go about your self-appointed business, Zizor. The Emperor's hand made a dismissive gesture. You plot and work to bring about other creatures' destruction. This pleases me. Knowing what I do about Boba Fett and the members of the unfortunate Bounty Hunters Guild, it is a process that I do not anticipate will take long to achieve the desired results. Come and report to me again when these sharper tools are ready to be delivered into my grasp. As you wish, my lord. Zizor bowed, then turned. The edge of his caped robes flared with that motion, the thick rope of his bound hair swinging across the exposed ridges of his vertebrae. I will also want to hear of your success. Lord Vader's hollow image spoke as Zizor strode from the Emperor's throne room, or the lack thereof. Zizor couldn't help smiling to himself as he left the presence of the Emperor and his chief servant. There would be successes. Of that he was confident, but not the kind they expected. I must warn you, my lord. The great doors to the throne room had sealed shut once again, leaving Vader in private consultation with the Emperor. Better you should surround yourself with fools than one with such ambitions. Your warning is acknowledged, Lord Vader. Emperor Palpatine gave a knowing smile. But it is hardly necessary. Prince Zizor likes to keep secrets from me but I see more deeply into his heart than he realizes. Then let me eliminate him for you, and remove the possibility of his treachery. And eliminate as well the value he has for me. The Emperor slowly shook his head. 
He is a sharp-edged tool in himself, Vader. He cuts through difficulties with ease. This scheme he has initiated against the bounty hunters is is a stroke of genius. Even Boba Fett, as smart as he is, will have little conception of what forces have been brought against him. The thin smile showed on the withered face again. There is great satisfaction that comes from turning a sentient creature's own strengths against him. Fett and the others like him will soon find out just how that works. Lord Vader's image was silent for a moment before speaking, words softer than his rasping breath. And Prince Zizor? His time will come as well, said the Emperor, when he will learn the same. He gave the same gesture of dismissal with one hand. Now go! The Emperor turned his throne toward the stars, the vast reaches that extended before him. I have other things to contemplate. Whew, and that is the end of chapter 10, which was a super long chapter, and it's all one conversation. Wow, okay, so there's a lot to kind of unpack in there, I think. Um, so we're basically seeing the layout of what's going to happen, which I mentioned in previous episodes, I was intrigued to know. So... Boba Fett has been sent into the Bounty Hunters Guild deliberately to cause so much unrest within the guild that he will make it crumble and the guild will exist no more. And it seems Boba Fett has agreed to this. It's very, very interesting and it's filling in some of those blanks. It's going to be really interesting to see then um, what Dengar up to because obviously uh, it seems that by that point the guild is over. So are we in this independent uh, world that they want? assuming from the events of uh, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back uh, that this plan works and that yes the bounty hunters do go independent so that it's easier for the Empire to use them. It's all a little cerebral, a little bit philosophical this whole bit. Did you enjoy that chapter? I found that chapter um, hard to read through but perhaps that was just uh, because I was trying to keep my head in with all those voices I was having to do um, and also my my Doing the Emperor is a little bit hard on the voice. Um, and there was a lot of that. But I've really enjoyed it. I think we will have time for one more chapter in this video, uh, as long as it's not another hour-long chapter. Uh, and then we will have to leave it there. But I will move on now to chapter 11, which is still in the same time frame. The first quarters they gave him were hung with silken brocades. The richly worked tapestries mirrored in the floors, inlaid with precious metals. I don't think so, said Boba Fett. He prevailed upon Kradosk's Major Domo, an obsequious Twi'lek like the one so often encountered in high-level service positions, to move him to a more Spartan residence in the guild compound. It didn't take much to convince the nervously smiling and bowing creature to accede to his wishes. Merely stating them and turning the threatening visage of his helmet toward the other was enough. I hope you'll find this more to your liking. The Twi'lek Majordomo's name was Ob Fortuna. His head tails, the bifurcated appendages that curved from his skull and rested on his shoulders like overfed snakes, glistened with a sheen of perspiration. He resembled a distant clan member that Fett had seen in Jabba the Hutt's entourage, the little space, an empty cubicle carved from the planetoid's underlying rock strata and the corridor through which he'd led Boba Fett, was chill enough to make his breath visible. The sweat was provoked by the bounty hunter's presence. If there's anything else you require... This will do fine. Boba Fett looked away from the Twi'lek and scanned the bare stone walls. Leave me. But of course... Bowing, the major domo backed away toward the rough hewn door. I await your fearsomeness's commands. Fine, do it at a distance. Boba Fett kicked the bottom of the door to swing it shut. That's all I need from you right now. He could hear the major domo's steps running down the corridor, the sounds fading away until the space was silent, except for a slow drip of water in one corner. 
a native insect bristling with antennae and eye stalks. A miniature version of the council member that spoke in nothing but questions had been aroused by the presence of humanoid body heat. It tried to escape as Boba Fett reached over with his armoured gloved hand, but his forefinger cracked the bug's chitinous shell and left the tiny carcass smeared on the damp rock. Fett watched as a swarm of smaller creatures scurried away. Vermin and cold didn't bother him. He'd been in worse places. This one had the advantage as well of being easily scoured for other bugs, the kind that would report one's words to Krados and his advisers. Fett hadn't even found it necessary to do a scan on the first room to which the Twi'lek had taken him, to know that the wall hangings had been studded with microscopic listening and observation devices. The old Trandoshan's welcoming party, complete with drunk act, hadn't fooled him. They know something's up, thought Fett. The Bounty Hunters Guild had been a tougher organisation in the past. Krodosk hadn't become its leader by being a complete idiot. Fett hadn't survived on his own by being one either. Krodosk would doubtedly have expected him to reject the luxury quarters and have an alternative already prepared. An alternative that would meet Krodosk's requirements. Boba Fett snapped on the scanning sweeps mounted in his helmet. A precisely calibrated grid snapped into view in the narrow visor. What do we have here? Just as he'd expected. Turning slowly on his boot heel, Fett saw the pulsing red spark in the grid that indicated a miniaturized spy module. He completed his scan, finding two more at varying heights on the opposite stone wall. It would have been easy to have extracted them from their niches and crushed them between his fingertips, the way he had the living bug. Instead, he took from one of his belt pouches a trio of audio drones, already set by him to reproduce the nearly subliminal traces of his breath and other homeostatic functions. He tapped the drones into place, directly on top of the bugs. No other sound would get past them. A signal in his gear would switch them off when he left the space, producing perfect silence. He didn't anticipate spending much time here. He'd really only wanted to give Krados a chance to display his hospitality and subterfuge. Any sleep or meals that Boba Fett required, he would take aboard the Slave One, safely docked and secured at the edge of the guild's main compound. I've got enemies here, he decided. There was no sense in making it any easier for them to get at him. Though if they wanted to talk with him face to face, this dank little room was sufficient for that. Just as he'd anticipated, he didn't have long to wait. A knock sounded on the splintered planks of the door. Then the rusted hinges bolted into the stone, creaked as the hand with claws and scales pushed it open. So we are to be brothers. Bosk stood in the doorway, his slit-pupiled eyes showing both resentment and a primitive guile. How pleasant that shall be for both of us. Boba Fett looked over his shoulder at the younger Trandoshan. That matters little to me. I take my pleasure in my work and in getting paid for it. You're famous for that. Bosk entered the space, his wavering shadow cast ahead by the torches mounted along the corridor. He sat down heavily on the bench carved out of one wall. I'd find my pleasures the same way if it weren't for you. You speak of the past. Fett stood in the centre of the damp stone floor, his arms folded across his chest. Have you forgotten already what your father said? The banquet had still been in progress as the Twi'lek Major Domo had led Boba Fett to his quarters. A new time has begun for us, for all bounty hunters. Ah, yes, my father. Shaking his head in disgust, Bosk leaned back against the wall. My father speaks of great and noble things. He always has. It's one of the reasons I despise him. The day will come when I sharpen my teeth on the shards of his bones. Family matters don't interest me, Boba Fett shrugged. It had been obvious to him for a long time before this why Trandoshans were not a numerous species. Deal with the old creature as you feel best, if you think you're capable of it. 
A low growl sounded from deep within Bosk's throat. He leaned forwards, eyes narrowing into slits as he focused on some personal vision. Some day, he nodded slowly, when the guild is mine. Fool, thought Boba Fett. The Trandoshan had no idea of the machinery in which he was already caught, the gears grinding out a different future than the one of which he dreamed. But that's why you're here, isn't it? Bosk looked up at him. Why you've come all this way to join the Bounty Hunters Guild. One clawed hand pulled a small box that had been dangling from one of his chest straps. He flicked open the hinge lid and dug out a wriggling morsel. Want one? Bosk held the container out on his scaly palm. Boba Fett shook his head. The little box's contents were identical to the insect he'd crushed against the stone wall. What are you talking about? You don't fool me, Bosk grinned as he refastened the box to the strap. As I said before, you might fool a senile old lizard like my father, but you can't do the same with me. I know exactly why you came here. And why would that be? It's simple. Bosk cracked the insect between his front fangs, then swallowed the two oozing pieces. You're aware of how old Kradosk is? You'd have to know. You had enough encounters with him in the past before I was even spawned. His time has to come to an end eventually. And then the leadership of the guild will pass to me. That's already been decided. There's no one on the council that's any younger than my father. Some of them are old enough to have cobwebs growing between their claws. They'll be glad to have me take over. You might be right about that. Fett had heard of other possibilities. There were other bounty hunters in the guild who were as young and hungry as Bosk. The leadership of the guild wouldn't be handed down without some kind of struggle. Of course I'm right. With the point of one claw, Bosk extracted a fragment of bug shell from between his fangs. And you're the proof of it. How do you figure that? Come on, let's face it. We've both been around the galaxy a few times. Maybe I don't have the same amount of experience that you do, but I'm a fast learner. Seated on the stone bench, Bosk smiled with cosy familiarity at Boba Fett. You'll be glad you've met up with me like this, rather than both of us scrabbling over some minor bounty. There's big credits to be made here, bigger than my father and his dried-up old cronies ever dreamed of. You know that, don't you? Fett didn't bother to indicate yes or no. I'm always on the lookout for a profitable arrangement. That's what makes you the kind of mean barb I really like. Bosk's carnivorous grin widened. My father was right about one thing. You and I, we really are like brothers. We should get along just fine given the changes that are going to happen around here. He leaned back against the stone wall. Like you said, we have to change with the times. We just have to make sure the changes go our way, huh? The assembler knew what it was talking about, thought Boba Fett. He had to give Kodama Bat credit for the accurate assessment of how things would go here at the Bounty Hunters Guild. Fed had been here for less than a standard time part, and already the pieces were falling into place. Better than that, leaping into place. The son of the guild's leader was volunteering to take his place in the scheme that would tear apart the organization. You're a clever creature, Boba Fett gave a slow nod of acknowledgement. Very clever. Smart enough to figure out what you're up to, pal. The slit-pupiled eyes regarded Fett with satisfaction. You're famous for a lot of things. One of them is that you've always been a lone operator. You've never worked with a partner. 
even in the worst situations. I've never had to, replied Fat. I can take care of myself. Yeah, and you still can. Like I said, you're not fooling me. All that talk back there in the banquet hall about the Empire squeezing us out. What a crock of nerf waste. The only reason you got my father and the rest of them to go for that line is because they wanted to believe it. They're old and tired and they're looking for an excuse to roll over and quit. But I'm not buying it. Things don't change like that. I've seen enough of the Empire to know that there's always going to be some use for bounty hunters. There's stuff we can do that nobody else can. An astute observation. One that you've made as well, I bet. Bosk dug at his fangs again, then inspected the tips of his claws. If anything, there's going to be more business for us with Emperor Palpatine than there ever was under the Republic. There'll be all sorts of creatures that the Emperor wants to get his hands on, who don't want to be found. That's where bounty hunters come in. Plus, the Rebellion. They got their needs too. That's the great thing about being on neither side nor the other. We can sell our services to anyone who can pay our price. And there's going to be a lot of buyers. The Strand Ocean also deserved credit, Boba Fett had to admit. Bosk might be a fool, and a particularly crass and bloodthirsty one, but he was sharp enough to discern at least one important thing about the nature of evil, which was that it always bred more of the same. More business for us thought Fett. He felt no emotion about that, one way or the other. It's a simple matter then, isn't it? Fett spoke his next thoughts aloud, of just making sure we get paid the price we want. You got that right, and that's why you came walking in here and asked to become a member of the Bounty Hunters Guild, isn't it? Not because things are changing out there. Bosk waved his clawed and scaled hand, indicating the reaches beyond the mould-encrusted stone ceiling. But because the guild is changing, or it's just about to, you've had it pretty easy for a long time, haven't you? Even when my father still had sharp fangs, he was never your equal in the bounty hunter trade. None of those old creatures were. And as they got older, all they really managed to do was get in the way of me and the other young hunters. The ones who would have given you a run for your credits, Fett. So, you've really had the field all to yourself, haven't you? Must have been nice. Fett gave a small shrug. It hasn't been exactly easy. Yeah, but it would have been a lot harder if you'd had to deal with me. Bosk's eyes flashed angry fire as he jabbed the point of one claw into his chest. If I'd been able to go up against you on some of those jobs the way I really wanted to, you wouldn't have been raking in those big bounties. The kind that Jabba and the rest of the huts put up if you'd had some real competition for them. Yes, said Fett. If I'd had some real competition, it might have been different. Bosk didn't pick up on the irony concealed in Fett's words. That's all coming to an end, though, isn't it? That's the real reason you're here. You know that my father and the rest of the Guild Council is just about ready to have their bones picked clean and that somebody else will be taking over. Somebody a lot harder and tougher who isn't just going to let you walk off with all the easy credits. And that somebody would be you, I suppose. Don't suppose with me, Fett. It's time for you and me to work some things out. 
You didn't come here just because you wanted membership. In the Bounty Hunters Guild, you're here because you know it isn't going to be long before I'm running things. I can tell how your mind works. Is that so? Bosk nodded. Cause it's so much like mine. You and me, we want the same things. Top price, and nobody getting in our way. But we've got to deal with each other. The last of the Trandoshan's smile faded. As equals. You idiot, thought Boba Fett. Negotiations between equals can sometimes be profitable or fatal. Let's go for a profitable one. Here's the deal, Fett. One claw raised, Bosk leaned forward on the stone bench. There's no point in us tearing out each other's throats even if it would be fun. That just lets the old ones like my father stay in power for a while longer. And they've had their turn long enough. I don't feel like waiting any longer than I have to, just to get my chance. What do you want me to do about it? It's not just what I want. It's what you want as well. Better you should get on my good side now, Fett, than have me for an enemy later on. The claw tip pointed to each of them in turn. Let's be partners, you and me. I know that's what you came here for. I see that I was correct when I said that you are a clever creature. Just not clever enough, thought Fett. Flatter me some other time, why don't you? After we've taken the Bounty Hunter's Guild. The fanged smile returned to Bosk's face. When I slice up my father's carcass, I'll save you one of the best pieces. Don't bother, said Fett. I'll be pleased enough knowing that I've accomplished what I came here for. Whether Bosk would be as happy about it remained to be seen. I'm glad. Really glad that we're in agreement about this. Bosk stood up from the damp stone. He stepped close to Boba Fett, bringing his face to where it almost touched the visor of the helmet. Because otherwise, I would have had to kill you. Perhaps. Fett didn't draw away. Though I think you're actually the lucky one. Look down here. Bosk's slit-pupiled eyes widened when they glanced down and saw the muzzle of a blaster pressed against his abdomen. Fett kept his voice level, stripped of emotion. We can be partners, but we're not going to be friends. I need those even less. Bosk regarded the weapon for a moment longer, then lifted his head and barked a raw-edged laugh. That's good. I like that. All the points of his fangs showed as he glared fiercely into the dark visor. You watch out for yourself, and I'll watch out for me. That's just the way I like it. Good. Fett slipped the blaster back into its holster. We can do business. As he stepped out into the corridor, Bosk stopped and glanced over his shoulder. And of course, he said slyly, this is all a private arrangement, isn't it? Between you and me. Of course. Boba Fett hadn't moved from the center of the space. It'll work better that way. For me, thought Fett, after the Trandoshan had stridden away past the flickering torches. For you, it's another matter. Whew, okay there. So, guys, that is not actually the end of the chapter, but it's an intense scene, and the video's been going for a good long time, so we're going to cut it off there. So, wow, so that's a big deal. We've got Bosk walking straight into Boba's plans. Bosk really kind of proving that he's not that smart a dude, considering that Fett immediately realized that Kradosk, Bosk's father, would have put listening devices in the room. Kro sorry, Bosk didn't seem to be aware of that and is quite happy to go and have out his devious little scheme about killing his father with Boba Fett's help directly in earshot. He's just lucky 
that Boba Fett had already scanned the place and covered those listing devices up, that his dad didn't know that he was planning to use this new member to gut him and eat him. Now, of course, I do understand that uh, Trandoshans, it seems, are so violent uh, by their nature that Kratos was probably expecting this of Bosk. I assume in a family where you eat your siblings, it's not that unusual for you to eat your parents when they're getting a bit too old. Did you guys enjoy that scene? I have to say, at the end of this video, ooh, I am tired of hearing people talk to each other. I think these one-on-one, -on -one very intense conversations, there's a lot to take in, and um, it's a little bit harder, so I'll be hoping for a bit more action soon. Um, although I can see that with the rest of this chapter, I think we are staying within the guild and we're going to see a little bit more of the sort of internal politics. So we can enjoy that next time, but maybe we'll see what the rest of the book has to offer. In the meantime, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. If you think you know someone who would love to listen to a Star Wars audiobook, let them know. Tell them, hey, every Wednesday, just after Boba Fett's come out, there's a new Boba Fett audiobook episode here on the Fulcrum Entertainment channel on YouTube. Share the video with them, share it with your friends, let people know. And if you really like it, subscribe. Hit that like button. And mate, if you have subscribed, remember to hit the bell notification or they won't tell you when our videos are coming out. Okay, I will see you all tomorrow for our Resident Evil audiobook, and then I'll see you on Sunday for our podcast. Or maybe I'll see you next Wednesday for the next part of the Mandalorian armor.